Twas the night before Christmas, Facebook edition. Twas the night before Christmas, and while the family slept, I tossed. So I put on my slippers, and down to the computer I quietly crept. My eyes wired open from too much late night caffeine. I hit the internet to see what I could glean. And what news of the world I could quickly look, clicked on to the world's biggest mouth, Facebook. Round and round my mouse did run, me thinking, this might be fun. And if not fun, well then at least it will help me sleep like a beast. When what to my incredulous eye should appear but a misplaced apostrophe, sad but true, dear. And then even more grammar errors did make my poor old editor's brain hurt and heart ache. Of course there were the twos, twos, and twos, so mixed they should have cried, we're abused! Not to mention the theirs, theirs, and theirs. Oh, the shame danced like snow in the air. Contractions, misspellings, and bad usage abounded. For such bad grammar, all English students are hounded. Who's to blame, I pondered, for this verbal travesty? Then came the answer, bright as the moon, technology. Computers and smartphones and tablets and texts, and how do kids use such power? To send sex. And who needs spelling when you can just LOL? If there's real justice, they'll go to English hell. And not just kids to make matters even better. Many of the adults' posts were just as bad. They, too, couldn't properly combine can and not. Their wrong possessives and plurals gave me the trots. Then a solution to this conundrum to me did appear, like a sleigh in the night led by eight, well, nine, tiny reindeer. I needed to find Mark, the bird of Zucker, and solicit his help with these language suckers. To him I would say, Mark, you have billions to spare. Let's make some new rules to ensure English so fair. Insist that Facebook users must complete and pass a grammar exam before, after taking a short class. And if they fail, they will not get a new password and won't be able to tell the world about their turds. This should be a threat great enough to curb the abuse of the English language and ensure proper use. I reached Zuckerberg. He was in the online phone book. He said he liked my plan and that he felt like a schnook for helping to unleash bad grammar on the world when he merely wanted to embarrass a girl. As visions of affect and effect rightly used danced in my head, I smiled joyously for a good deed well done and went back to bed. I dreamt of a new day when word choice would again matter, then awoke to my kids' cries, creating such a clatter. As the holy morning broke, the kids tried to post their status. They tried to hit Facebook, but found out that they had no access. They glared at me, mouths agape with horror, as I shared my tale of Christmas Eve night. This is my greatest gift, I said. Merry Christmas to all, and to all a good right. And while I'm here, <clears throat> my uh, lovely wife is here. This is the first time she's uh, been able to hear one of these, although she's heard me read many times. So I'm going to take advantage of her being here for just a few minutes to read something that I wrote about her for her, more about her. This one, uh, my daughters and I, Youngest daughter is also here. Are huge White Sox fans. Love the White Sox. Nothing against the Cubs, but we prefer the White Sox. Uh, prefer Major League Baseball. Oh, I'm sorry. I did I go making a Cubs joke. I apologize. My wife, not so much. Uh, she kind of puts up with it, endures it, and then eventually does this. So this is called the Margarita Man. Margarita. The vendor's growling bellow seemed to rise from the balls of his feet through his belly, which swallowed his belt and cast an impressive shadow on his shoes and up every inch of his long throat before issuing from his lips. His voice reached to the top deck of the U.S. Cellular Field, better known as the cell, where the world champion Chicago White Sox play. As he traipsed down the concrete steps towards the bottom of the stadium, then back up again, then over to the next row, it was quite an impressive display, giving new meaning to the idea of throwing your voice. We heard him coming our way from several aisles over, and my wife ordered one of the frozen treats when he eventually settled in our area. We sat in the sixth row from the rail, no more than 30 feet 
from Sox left fielder and blossoming superstar Carlos Lee. A big man, as outfielders tend to be, Lee was better known for hitting long, screaming home runs than for his glove work. Yet he was having an exceptionally good early season, both at the plate and in the field. And there we were, bathed in bright, warm, late spring sunshine. I sat with my two daughters and wife, ready to enjoy the game against the Oakland A's. The girls, about five and seven years old, had bought, quote unquote, bought the tickets to the game as my Father's Day gift. Well, I actually got the tickets gratis from a business associate, and the girls did not have revenue sufficient enough to actually, you know, buy me a souvenir, and I even had to pay for parking. Still, we were together at a baseball game. A real Norman Rockwell moment, if ever there was one. And what a game it was. The Sox and A's both played well. Lots of scoring. A couple of home runs followed by the obligatory fireworks that announced all home team homers to the surrounding neighborhoods. And some stellar defense by Lee, including a running, diving catch that sent him sliding across the warning track, pea gravel, and crashing into the outfield wall just below us. He was so close that we could practically reach out and help him back to his feet. Wow! This is any baseball fan's dream. To see his team play well against a solid opponent, to be able to share that moment with his children, to infuse his children with the love of the game that has carried America over and through so many peaks and valleys in the game's 150 plus year history. The pride, the excitement, the unadulterated joy. And then, I turn to my wife to see her reaction to Lee's amazing play. Hoping to see the awe in my eyes sparkling back from hers, I instead saw her head lowered to the cross-stitch pattern in her lap. And in her hand, a cross-stitch needle and thread poking meticulously through the pattern, creating an outline of something. I have no idea what it was, but it sure the hell wasn't a picture of anything having to do with baseball. Did you see that play? I nearly shouted, my incredulity bubbling over my self-control. What play? She said. I stared at her, expecting, uh, expecting a half smile or a cracked voice, some sign that she was only teasing me. Nothing. That play, right there in front of us! I jabbed emphatically to left field where Carlos Lee had resumed his position about 50 feet away and stood brushing the red dust from his uniform. Oh, no. She couldn't have been more nonchalant or disinterested if her middle name were Cucumber. Nearly apoplectic, I turned back to the game. The inning ended without any damage to the Sox, and the teams changed positions on the field. Seconds later, my wife's cell phone rang. Hello? Hey, how are you? Oh no, I'm not busy. We're here at the Sox game. My wife turned to me. What quarter is it? <laughs> Baseball doesn't have quarters, it has innings, and we're in the sixth inning. Both my volume and my temperature were running dangerously hot. <laughs> she returned to her phone and continued chatting about who knows what. Then she turned back to me. Who are we playing? My head felt like Mount Vesuvius just before it spewed death over thousands of the most unlucky Italians in history. Are you kidding? It's the Oakland days. They're right there. I pointed again to left field where a giant black man stood wearing a lime green, lemon yellow, and white uniform with a big A apostrophe S on his chest and hat. Oh, okay, she said, again turning to her phone. The Oakland A's, I guess. My blood boiled faster with each non-baseball related chuckle in reference to stitching, work, the weather, anything but the fantastic game happening right in front of us. Finally. I resigned myself to enjoying the afternoon with my daughters. They were well on their way to becoming hardcore baseball and most especially White Sox fans, just like their dad. Years later, we still routinely go to several baseball games together. Sometimes we bring family and sometimes we bring friends, but not my wife. We have never wasted another baseball dollar on her. <laughs> she doesn't mind at all. <laughs> to this day, when we talk about that epic game, that highlight of my young fatherhood, that pinnacle of family time. My wife, with face straight as a heterosexual man in a strip club, says that her favorite part of the whole day was the margarita man. Yeah. Thank you. <laughs>